This video is the second in a series of uh, gathering data and in this one we're going to talk about two ways of gathering data an observational study and an experiment. So um, first off <coughs> observational studies. Uh, observational studies are uh, well they're they're pretty good for discovering trends and relationships among variables uh, they're used quite a bit in uh, health studies and um, a couple of different types of observational studies. One is a, the retrospective study. This is when you're looking back at historical records, you're finding correlations or associations between variables. Uh, so when you're, when you're looking, when, the, when it's already happened and you're looking back at it, that's a retrospective study. And then of course we, all, we also have prospective study, excuse me, prospective studies. Um, this is a slightly more reliable method. Uh, this is where you identify subjects in advance and, uh, and then collect the data as the events unfold. Um, <clears throat> observational studies can show relationships between variables, they can show associations, they can show correlation, but they cannot show causation, okay? They are unable to determine cause and effect relationships between variables. Uh, and when doing an observational study, you must beware of the lurking variable. The lurking variable is, of course, the variable that if we're looking at two different variables and we're saying that one uh, is the uh, explanatory variable and was the response variable, and we assume a cause and effect relationship, then uh, what sometimes happens is that, that uh, the variable that we're assuming causes the response variable is actually caused by a lurking variable. Let, let's look at a, a let's look at an example. Uh, one might look at the uh, data uh, of a bunch of fires and see that when more firefighters arrived at the scene, uh, the cost of the damage went up, and one might conclude, ah, well then, obviously the firefighters are causing the damage. Therefore, we should send fewer firefighters to the uh, to the scene of a fire. Well, this is a rather obvious uh, um, error because the lurking variable here is simply the size of the fire uh, itself. That the fire, uh, the larger the fire, then the more firefighters are going to arrive, and also the larger the fire, the more damage is going to occur. So that is the observational study. We also have the experiment. Uh, experiments. Uh, are different from observational studies in that in experiments you mess with the subjects, okay? The subjects or experimental units, uh, they are uh, assigned to uh, treatments and the effect on the response variable is then measured, okay? So we, uh, uh, we do something uh, to the subjects and, uh, and then we see what happens in response. With experiments, you are able to determine a cause and effect relationship between the variables. Okay, so that is that's one of the biggest differences between an observational study and an experiment uh, from the statistical viewpoint is that experiments, uh, with an experiment, you are able to assign a cause and effect relationship. Uh, just like with sampling, bias continues to be a problem. We, uh, we're constantly trying to uh, get rid of bias. And with experiments, we need to be aware of confounding variables. Okay, and I'll talk about what a confounding variable is in, uh, uh, in a little while. Um, so, uh, let's look at a little vocabulary first. Uh, experimental experimental units. These are the individuals on which the experiment is being performed. Okay. When uh, when these individuals are humans, we generally call them subjects. Okay. The treatment is the intervention that's applied by the experimental by the experimenter to the experimental units. Okay. So the treatment is the thing that gets done to the experimental units. And then the factors 
Factors are just another word for the explanatory variables. Okay, it's what we call explanatory variables uh, occasionally when we're um, when we're uh, doing an experiment. Okay, so principles of experimental design. We have three main principles of experimental design: control, randomization, and replication. Okay, so these are three things you really want to do. You want to control. You want to control the sources of variation. Okay, what that means is. You want to keep everything other than what is being treated as constant as possible, as unchanging as possible. Okay? If you don't control well, then uh, the effects of your experiment may or may not be attributable to, to what you think they are. Okay? Uh, randomize. Okay? This is just like when in sampling. There's always going to be some variation in our experimental units, just like there's variation everywhere. So when you randomize, it reduces those uncontrollable sources of variation, okay? Whatever you don't control, you need to randomize. Uh, and in the case of, ex of an experiment, what you randomize is uh, how they are assigned to the treatment, uh, whether they're assigned to the treatment or whether they're assigned to one treatment or a different treatment, okay? And then replicate. Uh, <clears throat> this actually means two things. One thing is... Um, you don't just perform an experiment on one or two experimental, experimental units. You need to do this experiment on several experimental units uh, in order to uh, get good, robust results. Um, <clears throat> and it also means that in really in a, in, in a good situation, you would want to perform your experiment multiple times, okay? It means that you, uh, your experiment should be able to be, be performed again and, uh, you know, in, at another time, in another place, and that if done just like you did your experiment, you should reach similar conclusions. So, let's look at what a completely random experiment looks like. Okay, we start with subjects. And uh, then what we do is we randomly assign our subjects to groups. And in this particular case, I have three groups. There might be two, there might be four, uh, there's certainly more than one, okay? Each group uh, gets a treatment. The treatments are different, very carefully measured. Uh, everything else about the groups should be kept controlled, that is, should be kept uh, as similar as possible. And then, after the treatments, you go back and you compare the response variables. Okay? And it's pretty much as simple as that. That is your, uh, uh, your completely randomized experiment. Confounding variables. What is a confounding variable? A confounding variable is uh, <coughs> Confounding variables are variables that uh, cannot be pulled apart from one another. Okay? Uh, here's an example. A few years ago, I stopped eating meat. And the reason I stopped eating meat is that I found that uh, when I didn't eat meat, I felt better. And I discovered this when I went on a diet in which I gave up a whole bunch of different types of food, and one of them being meat. And when I went on this diet, I really felt a lot better. And, and I reintroduced everything else that I had given up. Uh, the only thing that I didn't reintroduce was meat and poultry. And um, the reason, like I said, the reason I didn't do that is I really felt, uh, felt like I slept better, felt like I uh, uh, was uh, um, more awake when I woke up. But later on I thought to myself, well, the purpose of the diet was to lose weight. And afterwards, I had lost weight. And perhaps, really what I was feeling was the effects of the weight loss rather than the effects of giving up meat. So it's very, very difficult for me to tell these effects. Okay, yes, I felt better, but was the feeling better due to uh, losing weight or was it due to giving up meat? I don't know, it's very hard. It's, it's impossible for me to really know. So those were two confounding variables in that particular experiment. Uh, there's also a very famous uh, 
uh, example of a credit card company that uh, wanted to test the sensitivity of the market to uh, uh, interest rate and also to um, the annual fee. But the experiment that they ran, uh, they tried to test both simultaneously and so they, um, they offered customers the choice of a card with both a lower rate and a lower fee against a card with both a higher rate and a higher annual fee. And uh, not surprisingly, the customers preferred the card with both the lower rate and the lower fee uh, by quite a big difference. But that difference was, it's, it was impossible to tell, well, was this attributable to the rate, to the interest rate, or was it attributable to the annual fee? No one could really tell because of the way that the design was done. So sometimes confounding is the result of bad design. Sometimes it's just the result of bad luck. Sometimes it's, it's, just, it's just what happens. So now we look at control groups and placebos. Um, <clears throat> now we, we saw earlier that uh, when we do a uh, completely randomized design, a randomized experiment, that different groups get assigned to different treatments. Well, sometimes what you want to do is you want to assign a group to no treatment. And that's what's known as the control group. Because sometimes what you want to do is you want to, uh, uh, you want to compare uh, how something has changed. Well, something might naturally change over time. Uh, for example, if you're uh, giving a child uh, physical therapy, um, and you want to say, you want to see, well, how much does this physical therapy uh, really help the child? Well, the physical therapy might be helping, or the child might simply be growing up. Uh, it's really hard to tell. So in that case, what you would want to do is you would want to have one group of children getting physical, physical therapy and another group of children, children uh, not getting physical therapy, just growing. Um, you might have some trouble, though, with the parents of the kids not getting physical therapy, thinking that their child is not being uh, treated as well as he or she might, which is a real problem with experiments. Okay, and then placebos. A placebo is, uh, <clears throat> it's sort of like a fake treatment. Uh, human beings uh, are quite susceptible to suggestion. And if we think we're getting a treatment, we might just start feeling better, or we might, st we might start responding to the treatment, uh, whether or not it's real. And so a placebo is a way of, of, getting, uh, of, of getting sort of a super control group. Uh, this control group, not only is nothing happening, the control group actually thinks that it is getting treatment. So that's what the, the placebo is. It's, uh, it's nothing but it actually acts like something. Blinding. Okay? Blinding is when you, uh, this, it, it has to do with uh, uh, control groups and placebos. Uh, you've been assigned to a group, right? Uh, now, again, because human beings are very uh, susceptible to, to suggestion, uh, you might respond just by knowing which group you're in. So sometimes you want to run a blind experiment, and a blind experiment is when the subjects just, they don't know what treatment group they've been, uh, they've been assigned to. Uh, either that, or those who evaluate the, um, what on, on here I said evaluate the drugs, uh, that would be one type of, uh, of experiment. Those who evaluate the results of the experiment don't know what treatment group uh, uh, anyone is in. Uh, that's what's known as a single blind experiment and a double blind experiment is when nobody knows. Nobody at all knows. And that's, that's really the best type of experiment. Um, oop, we've already been there. Let's now look at a blocked design. Okay, blocked experiments. This is very similar to stratified samples. You remember with the stratified sample, uh, what we did is we were worried that uh, there might be variation in our, uh, within our sample, uh, and so we would make sure 
that our particular strata were represented appropriately, not underrepresented, not overrepresented. The exact same thing is happening with the blocked design, okay? With the block design, oh, I might be performing an experiment on men and women, but uh, when I randomly assign my, uh, my subjects to the treatments, I see that, oh, unfortunately one of the groups is uh, far more female and one of the groups is far more male. This just happens sometimes. Um, so if you want to make sure that doesn't happen, uh, and make sure that uh, uh, gender does not confound with uh, whatever the uh, other variables are, what you do is you block your design. And that simply means you have one block that's the, uh, uh, the males and one block that's the females. And you do a randomized design uh, on the uh, males and a randomized design on the females. And then you uh, throw all the results back together at the end and compare. So that way you can see, that way you can uh, uh, make sure that the same, approximately the same percentage of males and females are in each treatment group. Um, matched pairs design is another type of uh, 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 design of an experiment. Now, with the prior experiments we were looking at, we were comparing you would uh, measure your response variable uh, for one treatment group and, and measure your response variable for another treatment group and take the averages of those and then compare the average. Well, with a match pair design, what you do is frequently you'll do, uh, you'll uh, administer a test to uh, each of the individuals, each of the, the subjects uh, in your experiment and then you'll do something with them and then you'll give them a post-test, sort of a pre-test, post-test type thing. And what you'll do is for each individual you will measure the difference. And then in the end, instead of uh, uh, comparing the averages, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be uh, taking the average of all the differences. Okay? Uh, another, uh, sometimes you're, you use the exact same individual uh, uh, for example, you might want to uh, see if people study better with music on than they do with uh, in silence. Uh, in that type of experiment, you would take uh, somebody and uh, give them a, a test and uh, have, uh, let them study for the test once. Uh, in silence and then give them another another test, a very similar test, and let them study for it with music on. And you would compare the, the difference for that one particular individual and then for everybody in the study you would uh, average up their, uh, their uh, uh, differences. Um, one thing you want to be careful with when you're doing a match pairs design, that the type that I was just describing, is uh, you don't want to have everybody do the silent uh, test first and then everybody do the one with music. You would want to have some of the people do it with, uh, do the music one first and then the silence. And some people do the silent one first and then the music. Just in case they get better the second time around, uh, you want to control for that variable. Okay, so, uh, and we've already looked at the block design. So really the only thing left to talk about is statistical significance. What is statistical significance? And what this is is after we've performed this experiment, how do we know how to judge our results? And this is something of a subjective uh, uh, question. Basically, if something is statistically significant, what that means is there's a difference that I just I'm having a really hard time believing that that difference just happened to occur by chance. Now things do occur by chance. That is absolutely true. Okay? Unusual things happen all the time. Okay? But you gotta draw the line somewhere. You run an experiment and you see a change and you think to yourself, well, could this change just be the, the result of normal random variation in, uh, uh, in the world? 
or is this change, did I control for all of that stuff? Did I, did I randomize uh, my groups? Did, uh, uh, did the variation cancel itself out in that process? And is the change really due to the experiment that I ran? Um, if it's a minute change, then you might very well say, well, this is just, you know, it's, it's because this one group over here was slightly different from the other group over there. But if it's a really big change, you might say, nah, there's just no way that, 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 that this big a change could just occur in chance, uh, just in nature. So statistical significance truly is in the eye of the beholder. And that's it.